Hello again from Israel. Uh, we continue with our ve uh, webinar and this, the second uh, talk will be by Gabriel Espitia from Me Mexico. Please, Gabriel. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Gabriel Mendes Espitia and I'm gonna present a genetic dissection of with uh, seminal roots development. I was supervised by my mentor, Dr. Tzvi Pelek and uh, my colleague, Guy Golan. So, wheat is one of the five most cultivated crops uh, worldwide. Uh, nowadays, with the, big, uh, with the population growth, uh, there is a deficit in uh, wheat yield uh, production. So in order to balance this, the yield, the wheat yield production, the wheat yield uh, has to increase in about uh, 45 million, million metric tons every year. But this is not an easy task, since uh, we have factors such as global warming affecting uh, climate. And uh, now this is uh, two degrees or more than that was uh, in the 1960s. And uh, this has caused uh, an erratic rainfall so we can see here that uh, this is high, moderate, and low, that uh, before the uh, rainfall was uh, a, uh, concentrated in just a season, was a seasonal. While this was in the past, while in the present, uh, it's more erratic. There might be a, a rainfall just in a couple of months, in a period of, of uh, drought, then again rainfall, and uh, so on. So this uh, may cause uh, lots of damage to the crops. So this puts a lot of uh, weight on the, uh, climate, the climate change and population growth, puts a lot of weight on the balance with uh, food security. So certain actions must be done in order to balance the equation. Uh, but uh, one of these actions is, is uh, to create drought tolerant wheat plants. And indeed, uh, nowadays, there have been a lot of research uh, regarding uh, drought tolerant plants, but most of them have been done from the emergence to the latest stages in wheat development. But uh, very uh, few has done, very little has been done in this tiny part from the sowing to the emergence. And this part is very important since the plants are susceptible and if the plants are affected in this very period, so what, uh, what was done by breeders or researchers in all the latest stages is useless. So as I said, the seedlings are very susceptible to drought, uh, or the wheat, the, the, the plants are very susceptible when they're very small, since uh, just a dry period may cause them to die, eventually to uh, wilt. So this uh, is translated in the yield reduction, significant yield reductions, and in dramatic cases, the farmers have to re the entire field again. So this, in consequence, would cause a not only le less revenues to the farmers, but also a, uh, a, in an increase in uh, food prices. So I'm going to do a full stop here, and in order to explain what kind of mechanisms, uh, what kind of mechanism I'm going to talk about during this presentation, I have to first to tell you how the wheat germinates. So wheat germinates uh, starts with uh, uh, wheat germinate wheat germination start with uh, first the development of the radical. Then we have the development of the second pair, of, the first pair of seminal roots, then the coleoptile, and finally the second pair of seminal roots. So this is how the entire structure looks like once it is completely developed. And uh, this is the case for most commercial wheat cultivars. But there are some other cases, such as in wild wheat, for example, in uh, Triticum turgidum. Uh, subspecies to the cocoides, where uh, uh, it develops uh, the same, the first uh, the, the radical, then the part of the coleoptile, but it uh, stops or delays the development of the second pair of seminal roots. So you may, you may think like, so what? This, uh, what advantage this has? 
So uh, I'm going to elaborate, first of all, the wild emmer wheat. It's a source of for novel genes to commercial wheat, var uh, to commercial wheat varieties, such as uh, uh, this kind of durum wheat is a type of wheat to use for pasta. And, uh, but the genes can be transferred, and this, uh, transferring, uh, this genes that uh, can be transferred to the commercial varieties may improve significantly the uh, drought tolerance. And interestingly, this, uh, a, um, a, uh, this wild wheat comes from places such as the Middle East. So this mechanism, such as what, to, what can be taken from the, the wild wheat to the commercial varieties, is let's say, for example, the, the, the seed germinated. And let's, see, let, let's say that there was a drought period. So the, the seed desiccates. And the, radic the, the radical and the first pair of seminal roots may die. But if the conditions improve, then the second pair of seminal roots may develop. So the seed can thrive, can survive. And the plumule and the coleoptena are still viable. This is, uh, by the way, regarding to one very old uh, uh, research that was done in 1950. So the main hypothesis, I mean the working hypothesis of all this research, not the, uh, my, my, my work was just a part of this, was if, that if this delay in the seminal root <coughs> development could have an impact on drought tolerance. So in order to see if uh, this indeed has an impact on drought tolerance, first of all, uh, in the 1990s, Joppa and Cantrell uh, published this uh, they, cr they, they cross the wild emmer wheat with an accession from Israel, and they cross with a commercial variety, in this case it's called Langdon, it's a durum wheat. They cross it with Langdon, and they created substitution lines. So I'm gonna explain briefly what a substitution line is. So a substitution line is, let's say, uh, we have the uh, two genomes, the one from the wild wheat and the one from the commercial wheat. So they took uh, just a, uh, well, this is a long process, but let's uh, simplify by just a pair of just a pair of uh, the uh, one part of the chrom uh, just uh, two pairs uh, two chromosomes were transferred <laughs> to a pair of chromosomes was transferred to the from the wild to the commercial, and they created the many subs well not many fourteen substitution lines, and this was created with uh, all several pairs of uh, uh, chromosomes. And uh, my colleague uh, Guy Golan studied them all in order to check uh, what uh, characteristics they have, like uh, commercial or interesting characteristics that could be studied. And uh, he found in the 2A that uh, this, uh, uh, this phenotype with the three roots. So this is, uh, this is when uh, my work started, like from here, in order to analyze uh, this uh, the, this two-way uh, substitution line. So my research, my research hypothesis is uh, if uh, there is a genomic re uh, there is a genomic region controlling seminal the seminal roots development on the, this chromosome two A in this substitution line. So my objective first was to phenotype the to phenotype the plants, then to genotype them, uh, later to create a genetic map, and finally from the genetic map create a quantitative trade loci analysis. So I'm gonna explain uh, uh, how this uh, happened. So first of all, this was uh, before I started. Uh, in the lab, they crossed the substitution line 2A with the Langdon commercial variety. And the, uh, the, the Bacros one was sold uh, six times until they got uh, 107 Bacros recombinant inbred lines at that uh, we call Brills. And this, is, this was the plant material with what I worked. And the phenotypic analysis I performed was uh, either with the five roots uh, phenotype or with the three, three roots uh, phenotype from the, the substitution line. So the results, the, my results from the phenotypic analysis was that uh, the substitution line uh, 2A, uh, the width, uh, uh, developed 4.17 4, uh, 4 as an average of uh, roots, while the Langdon uh, had a phenotype of uh, a constant phenotype of five roots. So later, uh, one, uh, once I, d I did the phenotype, I started with the genotype analysis, and I did it by microsatellite markers, uh, checking the polymorphism. 
and uh, a later a uh, compiling both phenotype and genotype the the, the phenotype the phenotypic and genotypic analysis i uh, we created a genetic uh, we could build a genetic map with the multi point package and from the uh, from the map that we created later we perform a quantitative trade loss analysis so this is a, uh, the handsome skeleton map we created. And uh, this skeleton uh, consists uh, of well, the, the length of it. It's a one 139 centimorgans with an average density of 19.86 uh, 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 centimorgans per marker. And uh, it was, it, uh, relevantly, it was just build, built with uh, eight, uh, uh, with eight a, uh, markers with eight microsatellite micro markers that it's quite relevant because so well most of the time the, the, the uh, in order to ha in order to have a very st a stable map there are more markers are required but we have a stable one with only uh, eight so later uh, we perform the the um, QTL analysis and we don't we just these eight markers, we got the uh, very significant uh, QTL with three point uh, lot score. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, QTL is 14.9 uh, centimorgans uh, long. So it explains this, uh, this uh, uh, QTL, this explains 30% 30, 30 of the variance for this trait. So it's, qu it's quite a lot. And uh, uh, besides, this wild allele confirmed a reduction of uh, 0.36 roots. So if Langdon has this uh, uh, gene, let's say, le it would reduce the, uh, in 0.36 roots uh, its phenotype. So once we got this, uh, we started with certain questions. So for example, a, uh, we have already, uh, we know where the genomic region is in 2A. So from it is like, well, are there other colocalized QTLs reported in this, uh, in this region that we found where our QTL is? So uh, in the literature, we found that there is a QTL uh, like very close in the, uh, uh, related to AVA uh, responsiveness, to abscisic acid responsiveness in chromosome 2A and at the same region. So we compared them, and uh, actually it has like very much similarities. There is this one that uh, we eliminated, but the, we added here. We know that this, uh, 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 I also tested it, and uh, it was polymorphic too. And we know that this in, the, in, in between these two markers, this uh, HBE340, while in this one where the marker is reported, it's also in the middle. So uh, it means that they are very close, this, two G, the, this uh, well, let's say, like, uh, these two genes, these two traits, these two alleles. So uh, um, the second hypothesis from me was like, well, if there is a, if uh, there is a QTL reported with ABA, so let's te let, let's test uh, the uh, the parental lines with ABA and let's see what the response uh, is. So we uh, we made a, an ABA test with the parental lines, uh, the uh, the two A substitution line and the commercial line. And uh, the, the control with the, the treatments were the control one micromolar uh, uh, ABA and ten micromolar ABA. So this is in control conditions. Uh, we got the constant phenotype, the, what we uh, were expecting, the constant phenotype of uh, five roots in Landon, while uh, uh, in uh, uh, the substitution line. We got what we were expecting, uh, more uh, 3.7 roots, uh, uh, it varies. Sometimes it has also five roots or four roots, but most of the time three roots. But uh, I want you just to compare these two uh, pictures, these two slides. Now when we apply the 10 micromolar AVA, uh, first of all, there was a, uh, uh, there was a, a high reduction in the size of the uh, roots in Langdon. And also, you can see that the number of roots developed was uh, was less. So, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, in the substitution line, it seems that the it, the, the the number of roots was not uh, the, let's say was not affected. In you can see that the, even the even the length of the roots was not that affected either. 
So this uh, brought us uh, so some other questions. So let's, uh, 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 from here, uh, we checked with the uh, statistical analysis if uh, the differences were significant or not. So uh, it comes that uh, in Langdon, in the commercial variety, uh, the, the difference with the ABA application was quite significant, while in the substitution line was not significant. And uh, what about the root length? So in the root length, you may see uh, a uh, shocking, uh, let's say, a reduction in the size of uh, in the length of these uh, roots. So while in the Langdon was not that re that much reduced, it was like uh, maybe from the control uh, was uh, significantly reduced, but not as much as with the Langdon. So this may this obviously suggests that the, the Langdon, the commercial variety, is more sensitive to ABA than the substitution line. So from here, uh, this is where my work stopped. Uh, I didn't have the time to go, to, to go on with this uh, uh, research, but uh, my, my, uh, the, the, the future, uh, say like the future work would be with the, first to map the QTL for ABA responsiveness on our population, first of all. Later, uh, to, this, to do some drought uh, tolerance testing also, and uh, to check if these traits, uh, if this loci affects other traits. It may be very positive uh, uh, in the, from the sowing to the emergence, but what if this trait affects uh, the yield or some other uh, important, some other important traits, so that's, uh, that must be checked too. So this project will serve as the template for further studies about the identification and functioning of the genes related to the seminal roots development in wheat. And uh, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, maybe I'll take the, the first question. Mm -hmm. Okay, what you've shown here is that the substitution line is more or less a, a how would I say, non-sensitive to ABA. Yeah. However, the wild wheat is considered as drought resistant. Yeah. In, and in drought resistant, the ABA does have yeah. a considerable role. Mm -hmm. So how would you explain this seemingly contradiction? Yeah, okay, so there are uh, certain assumptions about this. And one of them may be that uh, the Let's say the, uh, in case of the cultivar, and the, in case of the commercial variety, the ABA is causing all this reduction in the number of roots and length uh, because uh, it senses it. It has uh, this uh, sensitive in order to like, immediately it senses the ABA, it causes the, the, the impact. While in the, com in the, in the wild wheat, uh, let's suppose that in these harsh conditions where they live, like I mean the, in, in the wild, uh, this may be the plant itself may uh, may uh, the, the plant the plant itself it's considering that it's always under stress so it's like uh, let's say that uh, it's always uh, thinking that uh, it may develop less less roots than the uh, than the yeah, less roots than the other one than the commercial variety so yeah could I don't know if I <laughs> could there be another possibility as if for example different organs would have different uh, response to ABA or different uh, stages of development would have different uh, responses. Different responses to ABA? Uh, you mean like in the l later stages with the 2A? Uh, I would say... Uh, with the 2A or we're speaking of the whole plant. Yeah, not so the I, 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 th I think that this responsiveness uh, could affect the later uh, stages. If uh, it is if it is less sensitive in, with the roots, I mean in the uh, in the first stages, it is likely that it's gonna be affected. It, that it's gonna be less sensitive to ABA in the later stages. I mean in the, in the substitution line. So uh, this is why we have to uh, investigate if this uh, if this trait this uh, delay does not damp does not cause any reduction in yield or affect other traits. Because maybe this, uh, it's very positive here, but maybe later on the sensitivity is required for closing estomata or... 
What I what I'm, was trying to say is that maybe there are some other genes that are responsible for ABA responses, which are located probably on other chromosomes and might yeah. affect later stages, whereas this one is responsible only for ABA response at the seedling stage. This is also a possibility, yeah, of course, I guess. Of course, of course. Okay, we shall take questions from the audience, please. Yes, Bata. I'd like to ask, uh, what's the relationship uh, between the root development and drug tolerance? It's, uh, uh, you mentioned about the development of the root, and what's the effect of the, what's the relation of the root development and the drug tolerance? Ah, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak just uh, of, the, of uh, the very early stages. I'm just going to focus on that. So uh, the development is, let's say, if the, uh, if, the, if, if, if the seed develops all the roots, all the, its structure, all at once, and bad conditions uh, are present, so the, all, the, all the structure may, de may desiccate, may dry out. But if it doesn't develop all the structure all at once and certain part is still there, so if these harsh conditions are, pre uh, are present, later uh, uh, this may contribute to, uh, this may contribute, the, 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 what was developed may die, but what was not developed may uh, uh, develop later. So this is the assumption of that, uh, that th this is a, a drought tolerance mechanism at, the, at, at this stage. Did I answer your question? Yes. My question is a bit related to Fanta's question, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you just uh, looked at a certain genome region. Yeah. And now you are saying uh, you are focused on the drought, uh, the, the problem of drought yeah. during germination. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But Usually during germination, is there a problem of water? Because usually for germination, water is alkalized. What, what, water is what? Water is usually alkalized yeah. when you sow the seeds. Yeah, of course. So why, why, why do you consider the drought condition and the uh, soil condition during soil time? Let's say, like, well, I mentioned the part with the, with the rainfall. Let's say that the, you sow your field. And uh, you are you, you don't have irrigation an irrigation system. You are just considering the rainfall, and uh, a, um, so there may be some raining at one time a, enough to germinate your seeds, but not enough to develop all the plant. Not to develop these mechanisms that uh, maybe uh, in other researches that were added there, and um, drought tolerant, tolerance mechanisms. So a, what if the if the rain doesn't come? That uh, when until this uh, this uh, this later stages uh, are reached, so this is why it's very important to have certain drought uh, certain drought tolerance mechanisms at this stage that uh, are very few reported, maybe like three two, not that many. So uh, this is why it is important. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The last? The last graph. Uh, this is end. Uh, in uh, one uh, microbial area, you say that uh, there is significant difference between. Uh, you, are, you, you, yeah. you, you, you mean from here, here, and line, here? Yeah, the second line. The second, the blue, that it means the yeah, substitution line. Your standard error shows. Uh, some overlap. So what do you think? Ah, first of all, I consider here the standard deviation. Standard uh, error? Uh, not, not error, deviation. So this is how much the, 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 the population uh, varied. This is why you may, you may, you may, see, you may think that uh, they overlap in certain way. I mean, of course, with the standard error, they would be uh, smaller. But uh, what was your point about the, the overlapping? Just to, uh, if the bar shows standard error if it is uh, overlap. A standard deviation. But I assume standard uh, error. Ah, okay. If they, if if, if I showed, uh, let's say I changed them in, into uh, a standard error, would they uh, 
a, uh, overlap. Is that your question? If it is a standard error, uh, it is not significant difference. No, no, no. Doesn't which, differ which difference? Let me try to. Which difference are you speaking about? There is overlap of uh, the red color and the blue color. There? Yeah. With the standard. Explain this, please. OK. So uh, I'm going to explain the graph. Uh, three treatments. The three treatments were applied. Uh, the three treatments were applied to the the Langdon and the substitution line. So uh, in control conditions, this was the root length of the Langdon. While with the, the application of one micromolar ABA, there was a significant reduction from the control to to the one micromolar ABA. So uh, and even more when the 10 micromolar ABA was applied. So this is why I'm telling that the, uh, 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 while in the case of the substitution line, the control conditions were not that different, were not significantly different from. That's okay. The control conditions were not significantly different. For, uh, the control conditions were not significantly different from the one micromolar ABA uh, treatment. They were significantly different from the 10 micromolar AVA. This is uh, why I, 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 add, uh, I added this. And, uh, a, uh, but not, not, not as much. The difference was not as much as uh, it was with the commercial variety. So this is what, I, what this graph says. Do I answer your question? OK, let us take the last question from Kumar, please. Uh, as I know, when we internet and it, it will develop its ground root or its problem yeah. moment. I mean, the root will change in uh, another groups, uh, which is uh, at the time of germination, that root is not permanent root. What's the effect on changing on that root? Because that's the, that's the root which takes uh, plants, everything from the soil. That means crown root initiation, changing in crown root initiation. What's the relationship? Of this root, tendon in crown root, crown, crown, root? Yeah. We know what do you mean by crown root? Which is uh, with uh, germinate, and and the radical will change around 20 to 21 days in the another root form, which is permanent one, because the which we get in the previous one, it will not, it is not a permanent root. So at that time, it's the critical phase for irrigation. What this drought tolerance your uh, studies? Uh, so about this change in this uh, root. Yeah, you 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 mean uh, when it develops more roots than the the, the than the radical and the two uh, uh, pairs of seminal roots? Yeah, which you get at the time of germination. Yeah, that's not the permanent permanent root. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got my point. Yeah, I think so. But the yeah. question, the, I I, I know what your point is, but I don't know what your question my is. My question is that you 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 have. Uh, Drought tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what's what's the effect on changing on that? Because without that's the critical phase of irrigation uh, for changing of that root. Yeah. And if uh, the, this drought tolerance variety will perform better at that stage or not? Will it perform better than this stage or not? Uh, or is I think you are speaking of a different growth stage. Let, 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 let me tell you something. Uh, this, the, the, this shortly, Gabriel, yeah. because we have this, just this, this, uh, these pictures. This, uh, uh, um, these pictures were taken after seven days. Uh, not until the point that you, the, no, they didn't reach until the point that you mentioned. Uh -huh. And uh, actually, another test that uh, uh, we are planning to do is to test how much this delay, uh, how much, how long it, the, this delay is, is, uh, is another factor that we have to consider. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, we shall move on directly to our uh, next speaker. And uh, I will invite uh, here uh, Yermisrach Zwedu from Ethiopia, please. Hi, I am Imstra Sodu from Ethiopia. 
and I am presenting my research exercise on identification and genetic mapping of I'm presenting my research exercise on identification and genetic mapping of disease resistance genes in braid wheat. And this work was supervised by Dr. Roy Ben David from Volcani Agricultural Research Institute and Professor Amos Dunor from here. So I'm going to start by giving general introduction on wheat. Wheat or Triticum sativum is the oldest cultivated crop. It's originated in the Middle East or in the Fertile Crescent more than 10 to 12,000 years ago. It's a major staple crop, crop, obviously, sorry, providing about 35% of the food for the population. And its bread wheat is hexaploid with 42 chromosome numbers and three subgenomes, A, B, and D. And just to tell you some introduction about what, what other wheats are cultivated, there is a bread wheat and durum wheat, the major production being bread wheat. And we could also have two different kinds of wheat depending on the climate. The first one is the spring wheat, which grows in the hot or warmer climates, and the other is the winter wheat, which we found in the colder environment. The research exercise focuses on winter wheat, which are recombinant inbred lines resulted from the cross between Arena and Forno from Switzerland. So we will be doing that. I think my slide is moving. But this is to show you how wheat is highly produced in the world. There is annual production of about 690 million tons every year, and it keeps increasing, and also the world population is increasing. As you could see, it's not handling the amount of the population or the amount of people that grows, and it shows a little bit gap here. That gap could be attributed to a lot of factors. It could be abiotic factors like drought here, there is a pressure from the growth of population. It's not balancing it. And also, we could attribute this yield reduction to the biotic stress, like this is the viral disease. This is leaf stem, fungal disease, bacterial disease, aphids, uh, grasshoppers, or biotic, uh, biotic, both these are contributing to the yield reduction. So what could be? What is the major focus of this research exercises? I'll be concentrating on two fungal diseases of wheat, powdery mildew and yellow rust or stripe rust. Powdery mildew is a fungal foliar parasite, which is a biotrophic parasite, which feeds on the living organism. That's what biotrophic means. It's caused by the fungus blue meragraminis, the subspecies turiticae. This fungus has this kind of life cycle I will explain about. It has a sexual cycle here. Whenever, whenever it's over summering or whenever <coughs> it's over wintering in the case of the two climatic conditions, it will be over summering. Like, let's talk about the climatic condition here. So here, the Clistoca, it's over summers during when the season is not favorable or during hot conditions. Then whenever a favorable condition up appears, that is whenever there is high moisture and high water content, there would be emergence of the asexual spores that are called conidia. And these asexual spores are easy and they are picked up by wind and they would transmit from farm to farm or from country to country. They are so easy and that's what makes the this fungal disease devastating. It's easily picked and it can transfer from place to place. And it's responsible for like 5 to 34% yield loss. The other disease I'm going to speak about is wheat stripe rust or yellow rust. It, the spores made stripes all over the veins of the leaves. That's why it's a stripe rust. 
and it's caused by another fungi, Pusinia stratiformis, that subspecies Tritisae again. There is no much difference in this life cycle of these two fungal diseases. They, they have sexual life cycle, which they are going to hide themselves during the unfavorable conditions, and they have the asexual life cycles on alternative hosts, like they could stay on weeds or crop derbies, leftovers. For this uh, yellow rust, there was no alternative host till, uh, host till this year, but in China, they have found that very species could be an alternative host that's going to help the fungus pass its unfavorable condition. This also could be responsible for the yield loss that reaches about 30. Sometimes whenever there is high emergence, it could reach about 50% whenever there is drastic emergence. So what could be an alternative to solve this problem? This is a biotic stress or a biotic factor responsible for yield reduction. What could be done? We could use an alternative solution like production of resistant cultivars. We are talking about which so we could do resistant cultivar development. When we are developing these resistant cultivars, we should look for resistant plants. And in those resistant plants, we would find plant resistant genes. This plant resistance genes could be qualitative. These are generally risk specific. They are controlled by single major genes. And we could also have quantitative resistance. This is a horizontal resistance, and normally it's thought to be non-risk specific, and it's controlled by polygens. So far, 46 powdery mildew and 53 yellow rust resistance genes are identified by different groups of scientists and different chromosomes and loci in wheat, in durum wheat, bread wheat, emmer wheat, and other relative crops. From the population, the arena and for no parents, which we are working this research, there were some durable resistant genes identified, like the LR34, YR18, and PM38. These are durable genes. That means mostly whenever there is identification of disease resistant gene, there is a tendency to be overcome by the virulence genes. But for these ones, they are staying for a long time, so we could call it durable resistance. That is the objective, or that is the importance of looking for disease re resistance. Having a durable resistance, that's going to stay somehow for a long time, and that's going to sustain the yield need. So the objective of this study is to look for resistance genes, to identify them, to map them, and to characterize what kind of genes they are and what is the mechanism behind that. The first objective is a preliminary research to see whether the different soil media has an effect on the phenotypic response of the plants, or whether do we have any difference between the abactual and adagial surface of the leaf, or can we find any difference when we are inoculating the isolates in the basal, in the middle, or in the tip portion of the leaf. That was the preliminary exercise before we go to the major work. The next objective was identification and characterization of powdery mildew resistant genes in the recombinant inbred lines. These recombinant inbred lines are a result of arena, which is resistant to powdery mildew. And they are also cross with forno, another parent that is resistant to the yellow rust, and it's moderately resistant, or it's a little bit susceptible to powdery mildew. So we would like to see which lines or how many proportion distribution there is going to be for resistant of these two genes or two diseases. And the other is to test if there is any association between the genes to be found, are they new genes? Are we looking at the previously found genes? Do they have any control, any association? That is the other objective, and we will see if we have achieved it or not. 
and now go to the material emitters. We have used 200 recombinant lines which were grown in the greenhouse condition with parents and with susceptible control, which was cultivar in bar for powdery mildew and Lebanon was used for yellow rust resistance. This is growing them in the greenhouse. The four types of soil medium we have tested for preliminary research for mixed soil, sandy soil and fertilizer, peat and sandy soil alone. These were tested for parental lines and the susceptible variety in bar. And these are the powdery mildew and yellow rust isolates used. These four isolates were tested before on these parental lines and they were able to create differential resistance. There, there was a lot of a lot of trial and error and this was creating differential resistance and they were used or they were tested. These are three ways of the powdery mildew and only one race of yellow race resistance was used which is PCAC 506. The media preparation for the powdery mildew was agar and 50% of benzimidazole and these are our plants after growing in the greenhouse whenever they are 15 days old or whenever there is emergence of the second shoot, they will be cutting off and culturing of the first leaf for inoculation and phenotyping. The inoculation process is first the leaves will be segmented and they will be cultured in three replicates like this. Then the powdery mildew isolate, the powder will be put into a paper and it will be blown into a settling tower for inoculation. After inoculation, they will be transferred into incubation. That would help for the growth of the fungus. And after 15 days of incubation at 15 degrees Celsius and 12 hours of photo period, they will be transferred to 7 degrees Celsius of storage time for use, for test, for any other purpose. And this is the yellow rust inoculation. The yellow rust inoculation was done by spraying. This powder or the spore of the yellow rust was mixed with a mineral oil sorbitol and it was sprayed under the hood and this were stayed for about 24 hours to get dry. Then they were transferred into a dew chamber for the growth of the fungi. Then they were stored in seven degrees Celsius and both of them were scored phenotypically. When we were scoring phenotypically, we were using zero to four index. This is a classical phenotyping score, phenotypic scoring index. And if there is a well development of the fungal powdery mildew spores, like as you see, we could give it three to four. And whenever there is no growth of the spores or whenever there is a little growth of the spores, we could give it zero to two and those lines are phenotypes as resistant. So this is the scoring and this is pretty much what we did in the material and methods. After this, the first result we have found is the preliminary result on the soil. We didn't find any significant difference between the four soil medium used for the three isolates. As you could see, this was done under 99 confidence interval by a Taki Karama test but we couldn't see or any colony number or any colony count difference in the three isolates in all the types of medium used. The second result we have found was the orientation of infection. We have infected the tip, the middle and the leaf base and there was a significant difference for the tip part of the leaf. It shows susceptibility. So what was the importance of this preliminary ex experiment was to see if there's going to be any misleading phenotypic test or if there's going to be any error because the T parts were showing a lot of colony count or they were relatively susceptible than the two parts. We were avoiding in the consecutive experiments for phenotyping and for gene mapping. The other is I told you they are the result of 
uh, resistant and moderately resistant cultivars, the recombinant and bread lines. And we saw what is the reaction between the recombinant and bread lines towards the three isolates of powdery mildew. We have found segregating response to the three isolates of powdery mildew. Some lines were resistant, susceptible, some were the resistance. This was similar for all of the isolates. Like you can see here, there is susceptible, there is resistant line. Also, and the mechanism seems to be similar. The lines which are susceptible for 213 were susceptible in 210 and 211, like that. And then we try to see the distribution of resistance and susceptibility. Is it controlled by a single gene or is it controlled by a polygen? We did a chi-square analysis. And as you could see, there was no significant difference here. I, couldn't, I didn't put a bar because it's obvious. Yeah, the segregation for powder immediate reaction showed a one-to-one -one ratio. That means there, there was the resistance and susceptibility was controlled by a single major gene. If there was no two, three genes, there has to be different ratio. And the genetic mapping, we did a construction of this genetic map for the powdery mildew and yellow rust isolates. And it was found that the three powdery mildew isolates were resistance genes were found to be on the 7D chromosome distal end which is the location of the durable resistance for LR34, YR18, and PM38. The reaction of the inbred lines towards the yellow rest also was similar. Some were resistance, some were susceptible. The main difference thing is, in the powdery mildew, we could see some, some showing moderate resistance, like here, they are not showing any much more susceptibility. But in the yellow rest, you could see there is high susceptibility and resistance with no moderate interference. The chi-square test also was tested for the <coughs> yellow rest resistance. And it was found out that it was one to one ratio, which is not significantly different from a single dominant gene control. And the mapping of this isolate 506 shows lies on the long chromosome of 2A, which was the location of a previous gene, which was identified in 2009. So we can conclude from this results, we could say the result, the response of this recombinant embryo lines was segregating for both powdery mildew and yellow rest. But we could see susceptibility, moderate resistant, and resistant in powdery mildew, which we didn't find in the yellow rest. The positions were 7D and 2AL, as I told you. Yeah, we could say there was, we were looking for a new gene, or we were thinking about if there is any control of any other genes, but we can conclude that the resistance displayed by uh, the resistance against the yellow rest 5006 could be a result of the presence of this YR, YR1 gene. And there was no association between this QTLs like LR34. We were thinking about if the re recombinant and bread lines were containing this allele, they could show resistance. But because the location was like 2A and 7D, there was no association between LR34 and the LR rest resistant. What is the way forward? This is a preliminary gene mapping, but we could use it for identification of molecular markers associated with it. And we could also use for cloning and fine mapping. Maybe we'll be doing it for thesis work as a molecular genetics. This is the conclusion, and I would like to extend my Gratitude or my thanks to my mentor, Dr. Ray Ben David, and Professor Amos Dinor, which was he was there all the way. And this work was in collaboration with Tel Aviv University and University of Zurich. So I would like to thank those people also. I would like to thank for 
Hebrew University of Jerusalem for giving me this opportunity and for making me part of this prestigious institution. And finally, thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. Thank you, Irmisa. We'll take questions. Yes, Javier, please. Uh, is this method. This fungal diseases are biotrophic. They only can feed on the living tissue. So they have a mechanism, some chemical or enzymatic mechanism to keep the tissue alive while they are growing. If there is a resistance, there is, there is not going to be any growing of the fungus. The leaf dies or it becomes yellow, it dries out and dies. But because that there is some susceptible gene, it's responding to the fungus, it's going to stay alive as a mechanism to sustain for the fungus. So you would know if they are resistant, like you said, they would be damaged and died, but because they are not resistant, they would respond like the hypersensitivity and the microbiology. Do you remember? Yeah. The yellow spots you see is The necrotic, yeah. The necrotic tissue are, if they are necrotic, they are resistant. They are not allowing the pathogen to grow. Yeah, that's how we know. Indeed. Other question? What was the plant material you used and why did you choose it? Why was it chosen, this, this, the, the wheat that you chose? The wheat, the recombinant in bread lines. But, but what, were the, what were the parents? The parents, yeah. Arena and Forno, they are winter wheat cultivars. But I didn't choose them, they are part of the project. Okay. I have a question. First, I, I, I didn't understand where the issue of the soft And then also, like, sometimes in breeding, we have a problem like sometimes you breed for resistance and then you get like, it's negative. In fact, so what do you say that? Bridging. Okay, with regard to the soil medium, we were thinking like if they are growing in different environments, there is going to be a difference in soil composition. Some place is going to be sandy, other places are going to be loamy, something like that. Whether maybe the soil type is contributing to the reaction, to the susceptibility of the plant. That's what we wanted to see, but we couldn't find any difference. And about the breeding aspect, if we can identify which genes where they are on the chromosome, we could find markers, and we could imply that into marker-assisted selection for resistance against powdery mildew or any other disease. I was asking the relationship of this, does it reduce yield? Yes, it can reduce as much as 34% powdery mildew whenever there is an outbreak. Okay, maybe I don't understand. If you can breed for a certain trait, and then you get that trait is now reducing the yield, instead of increasing the yield, maybe the yield will reduce. So what is it, how do you relate that for the mildew in terms of genes that are identified? Oh, are you asking me if this, the resistance genes are going to affect yield? Yeah, negative yield. Penalty. If they have yield penalty. Yeah. They don't. That I haven't read about that. Other questions? Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> so we shall move on to our next talk. And uh, let me invite, please, Betewulin Adem from uh, Ethiopia.
Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Olin Chetu from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm going to give a seminar on my research exercise, which I did under supervision of uh, Dr. Rivka Elbao in collaboration with Dr. Samir Mabjish from the Department of Animal Science. So, uh, for introduction, uh, silicon, uh, sorry, uh, my research exercise uh, uh, is entitled, Does Silicification Affect the Cellular Composition? And the study was in sorghum by color. Uh, for introduction, uh, this silicon is the second most abundant element on the earth next to oxygen. So this element exists in the soil uh, in the form of silicon dioxide and the, taken up by the plants uh, in the form of silicic acid. So uh, there are uh, LSI1 transporters in the roots, um, mainly in the uh, main roots and lateral roots, which are responsible for the influx transport of this element. And then uh, there are also efflux transpo transporters of this element called uh, LSI2. And then from the xylem parenchyma to the panicles, it's uh, exported by the LSI6 uh, uh, transporters. And once they reach the leaves in the form of con uh, in the condensed form, in the leaves, what happens is that the, the transpiration will take off all the waters, and only the amorphous silica will be deposited. And in the cereals, this silica is deposited in the form of uh, opaline pytholids, where it, it tightly binds to the other uh, tissues in the epiderms. And then, if this element is uh, highly deposited in the plants it will have some important contributions from the plant side. Like uh, it can contribute for the resistance of the plants to biotic stresses. And it can also contribute for the tolerance of the plants to some abiotic stresses like manganese uh, has been demonstrated by uh, uh, these uh, scientists in 2011. And an increase in yield has been uh, discovered uh, in rice, which is of course the largest accumulator of this element. Uh, despite its such importance uh, to plants, especially to uh, grass families, uh, the plants failed to uh, show any symptom of uh, as a deficiency or excess of this element. Therefore, uh, it was a problem for the uh, physiologists to detect the movement of this element in the plants. However, it's obvious that silica and germanium are from the same periodic table, the, uh, from the same group in the periodic table. So this germanium uh, is a chemical analog to silica. Uh, therefore, what happens is that this, since this germanium is a trace element and it's not available naturally to the plants in the soil, so whenever you provide the plants with this element, the plants will get poisoned. So th this was uh, one of the important uh, breakthroughs that helped to determine the movement of its analog, uh, its chemical analog, that's uh, silica. <laughs> and this uh, uh, concept has been uh, uh, confirmed by uh, Miroslav and his colleagues in 2007 by just des uh, describing that these two elements share the same uh, transporter for their movement through the xylem tissue. Uh, although Rice is the largest accumulator of this element. Other uh, family, uh, members of the Poache family, like uh, sorghum, maize, and barley, can also be able to accumulate the amount less than, uh, the amount less than in rice. Uh, if we look at the phylogenetic alignment of uh, these uh, crops, uh, sorghum, maize, rice, and other barley, uh, they, they, are, they are from the same ancestor, and they are on the same tree. So uh, uh, we can uh, talk about sorghum. So uh, I would like to say a few about sorghum. So this uh, sorghum has its first domestication started in Ethiopia. And currently, it's under uh, cultivation all over the world, but especially in uh, uh, Asia and Africa, where its uh, grains are consumed as uh, food, and the other shoot parts are consumed uh, for, just provided for animals as a forage. Uh, both the silage and the fresh shoots can be uh, provided for the animals as a forage. Uh, in Israel, this crop is uh, purposely grown for the animals' feed. 
this crop can grow, this crop can grow and give good yield under situations or under water stress conditions where even we don't expect other crops to survive. Uh, according to Van Schuist and Jones in 1968, uh, they did uh, an experiment on the digestibility of uh, grasses uh, which are utilized as forage for animals and then they demonstrated that uh, there was low digestibility by the ruminants, by the ruminant animals due to high lignin, which was contributed because of the high silica in the uh, cell wall of these grasses and uh, the high uh, cellulose and hemicellulose, which are described as NDF and ADF here. Uh, when we look at the reports on the identification of the genes encoding for the silica transporters, uh, most of them are confined to silica and we couldn't find any reviews and reports uh, showing the uh, mechanism or molecular mechanism of uh, this silica uptake by sorghum. Apart from this, uh, due to the complexity of understanding the physiological mechanism of this uh, element transport, plant physiologists largely ignored it. And furthermore, the relationship between plant genetics, silica metabolism, and its impact on the cellular compo components in relation to uh, cellulose and hemicellulose is not investigated yet. With this, uh, the objective of, uh, uh, the aim of uh, our study was to compare two genotypes of sorghum, the ones with high silica content, which are the wild types, and the ones with very low silica uptake, which are the mutants, for their uh, silica uh, composition in the cell wall in relation to the other cellular components, like cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Uh, uh, our experiment was bidirectional. We did it uh, both in the lab and in the greenhouse. So in the lab, we started the, the experiment uh, by seed extraction. So uh, seeds were extracted from the two uh, genotypes of sorghum, the wild type and the mutant. And then they were treated with 10% uh, sodium hypochlorite and then they were sown in a petri dish with a softened, uh, with a moistened soft tissue. And then these uh, uh, seeds were left to germinate for three days. Then after three days, again, uh, we prepared the hydroponics medium from uh, germanic acid and uh, murashige and skook medium in five liters of uh, water. And then we uh, moved the seedlings into this uh, uh, Germa uh, Germanic acid uh, hydroponics medium. And then we moved these uh, uh, seedlings on a tray with this, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, hydroponics medium in a green, in a gross room with a photo period of, uh, with a photo period of uh, 16 hours per day and with light intensity of uh, 600 lux. And the temperature was 30 degrees Celsius. And then we left them to be there for 10 days. And then after 10 days, we just isolated the seedlings which are resistant to germanic acid, supposed to be the mutants, and then uh, the wild types, which are showing uh, a necrotic spot, brownish spot on the leaves. So uh, we hardly found uh, seedlings that are, uh, that are uh, uh, resistant to germanic acid, but we found 17, 17 wild type and 31 mutants, which we transplanted into the greenhouse having pots filled with soil media containing 7.4 parts per million of uh, uh, silicic acid. And then the next experiment we did was uh, genotyping. So for this, we collected 100 milligram of leaves from uh, each plant from the greenhouse after three weeks of growth. And then we did the genotyping to, to, uh, to observe the mutants and the wild types uh, in uh, at molecular uh, basis. So uh, the DNA fragments which were heated in the PCR during genotyping were separated on a gel. And uh, here, what you see here is uh, the, the position of this uh, LSI1 gene, which I, I was telling about, I was telling so far, in a chromosome. So uh, I can draw it uh, on the board. Or 
so if this is uh, the chromosome, this region is uh, the LSI1, the LSI1 region. So this uh, encodes for the transporter. So in the mutant, we don't see, we don't find this one. So here we we had primers. Here we have primers. Uh, primer number thirty-eight. This is the forward, and here we had the uh, primer number. Uh, uh, in the wild type, it was primer number forty. So this was encodes only in the wild type. So here in the mutant, we didn't have uh, this, uh, and then. Uh, here we have the forward primer, which is the same, and then we, here we have the primer number 135. So, uh, because I'm going to show you a, a, a band which is contrasting from what you know. So here, uh, the mutation was in the LSI1 uh, region, and then these were the details of the primers that, that were used uh, to amplify this region. Uh, the next experiment we did was uh, chemical analysis. So in chemical analysis, we looked at the uh, mineral content and the silica composition, the NDF and ADF, which are supposed to be the cellulose and hemicellulose, and the lignin. So uh, for all of these experiments, we started with 0.5 gram of uh, partially dried leaf samples that has been uh, finely ground. And then for the ash, for the Silica composition, we started with the ash. And then this ash is supposed to contain the mineral contents, like calcium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. So here, uh, the uh, partially dried leaf sample was ignited at five, uh, 600 degrees Celsius overnight in a muffled furnace. And then it was washed with one, millim with one uh, uh, molar of hydrochloric acid to get rid of the other uh, organic and inorganic uh, chemicals except the uh, silica. So the, rem the remnant is supposed to be uh, silica. So the next experiment was then uh, according to the conceptual diagram that's developed by uh, Van Soest. And here, the concept is like this. Here we have a plant cell. So when we treat this plant cell with neutral detergent solutions, it will digest the neutral detergent solubles which is supposed to be the cell contents that like soluble carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, minerals, and vitamins. And then it will give us the neutral detergent fiber, which is uh, not uh, digested by this. And then here, again, we will treat with this one, the NDF with uh, acid detergent solutions. So this acid detergent solution will digest the uh, hemicellulose. It's able to digest the hemicellulose and then it will give us the acid detergent solubles, that's hemicellulose, and it will give us again the acid detergent fiber. And then finally, we just digest this one using 72% uh, uh, sulfuric acid, which is able to separate the acid detergent fiber protein and the cellulose from the lignin. So what we get finally is the lignin. So this is a conceptual diagram, and these are what I told you so far in, on the diagram, the methodologies. So uh, with this, the first result we had was for hydroponic selection and uh, genotyping. So here, uh, we were expecting to see 25% uh, of the seedlings to behave uh, as if they are from a recessive gene. So fortunately, we, we got uh, on the tray number one, we had two trays, and on, the, on tray number one, we had the expected uh, result but in tr on train number two, due to some uh, technical uh, problems, we didn't get the, the expected result. But this one was enough to explain about the experiment. And uh, here, this is the performance of the seedlings after germanium selection. What you see here is the mutant, which is lacking the LSI1 transporter. So it behaves as if it didn't grow on any germanic acid uh, solution. So this is the wild type. As you see here, it appears, uh, it appears like a, a necrotic brownish uh, spots are uh, just observed on the leaves. And this, the next one is genotyping. So in genotyping, this is for the wild types. So on the wild types, we had uh, these bands, these bands. And then in the mutants, we had again these bands. And uh, the last 
uh, result we had was for chemical analysis. The first chemical analysis we looked at was the uh, mineral content. So the mineral content was highly significant in the wild type, significantly higher in the wild type compared to the mutant. And then the next was silica composition. This was also uh, significantly higher in the wild type uh, as compared to the mutant, as you can see from here. And this was the neutral detergent fiber, which contains the cellulose and hemicellulose. And it was also significantly higher in the wild type compared to the mutant. And then this was a acid detergent fiber, supposed to be uh, the, cell the cellulose. And this was also uh, higher in the wild type. And we didn't get a significant result that, uh, in the significant difference in the acid, dis lignin, uh, acid detergent lignin. And uh, for discussion, in germanium selection and genotyping, as I, I showed you previously on the table, the germanium selection revealed a 3 to 1 ratio of healthy and defective seedlings. Therefore, based on Mendelian inheritance, uh, we say that the mutation is in a single recessive gene that's responsible for the uh, uptake of this germanium oxide. So the PCR results separated on a gel revealed the DNA size of the wild type clustered close to 250 base pair, and then the mutants close to 750 base pair, which suggests that the, the gene that's responsible for the silicon uptake is impaired. Uh, in chemical analysis, we didn't see any morphological difference between the seedlings in the greenhouse growth, except uh, we saw uh, an impaired growth in the, uh, in the wild type, like brownish spots. And uh, the chemical contents, like uh, the uh, ash and the silica composition, uh, gave us significantly higher result uh, percentage in the wild type compared to the mutants, leaf tissues. And this implies that reasonably less silica is bound to the cell wall in the mutants due to the defect on the specific silica transporter gene in the mutant. And according to Jan and his colleagues in 2002, where they looked at the silica content in the, in the shoot and overall biomass of the rice mutant GR1, and they reported that significantly less silica was bound to the mutant compared to its wild type relative. So when we look at the cellulose and hemicellulose composition, uh, in the wild type, it was significantly higher compared to the, to the mutant. And this means that the, silif the silica affects the composition of cellulose and hemicellulose. And the acid detergent fiber composition was, uh, it was uh, like by 1.6% higher in the wild type compared to the mutant, however, this is, uh, for, for us, this is uh, enough uh, reasonable uh, percentage difference to explain about when, when we look at a chemical composition point of view, and it's at tissue level. And with this, we came up with the following conclusion. Here, the role of uh, LSI gene on the silica uptake transport and uh, deposition in the leaves of sorghum was evidently demonstrated. And the leaves of sorghum obtained from uh, wild type and mutant for the LSI1 transporter gene revealed a difference in the silica, in the uh, mineral content, and in the ADF composition. However, a contradicting result was observed on the acid detergent lignin uh, content. Therefore, from our preliminary result, we conclude that the, the silicification level in sorghum alters the composition of the cellulose and hemicellulose in the cell wall of sorghum. So thank you, that's it. Yes, we'll take questions. Uh, what is the, the future perspective of your research? Because uh, from my understanding, and you should also state the, the significance of the future of Plus, you said something about uh, usage of uh, one molar ACL, right? For the yeah. digestion of organic compounds. Uh, maybe you should try to tell us other compounds that can also be used to, that will not digest the uh, organic compounds but digest the same. Okay. okay. Uh, so, for, first of all, this experiment is ongoing, and this is a preliminary work to just the future work is to go till the, the digestibility test. 
So this is a preliminary, a preliminary work to look if there is a difference at cell wall composition, in cell wall composition between the two genotypes. And the future is to test again the digestibility of this, uh, this uh, genotypes, if there is a difference. And it's going on, but uh, the result couldn't uh, reach on time. That's the future. Work. And uh, for what you said, you said like. Uh, no, you said to use one more hour. Yeah. Right? So I'm not sure about the concentration, but uh, I read like uh, hydrofluoric acid is able to digest silica, uh, but it, it cannot digest the other uh, inorganic compo components. But it can digest silica. And the hydrochloric acid can digest the other inorganic compounds, uh, components, but it cannot digest silica. Let me ask a question mm -hmm. on something. Sorry, I take the, <laughs> the right of the chairman to <laughs> ask this. <laughs> You've shown here the differences between, let me speak to the mic. You've shown here the differences between a mutant line and the wild type. And that the uh, mutant uh, accumulates less uh, silica, and it also has some different uh, attributes with respect to uh, digestibility. Mm -hmm. However, your conclusion is going like uh, two steps ahead, saying that silica accumulation affects the uh, digestibility of the, um, of the plant material. Is it not something missing in between? I mean, can you, can you infer from this directly to a cause-effect relationship? Of course I can, but for, for the answer, I can answer. But uh, here I didn't mention uh, uh, digestibility. It's, a, it's a, just a feature work. It's, okay, it's a feature ADL work, but and ADF, yeah, yeah, it's uh, because if a, a certain plant has a high cellulose and hemicellulose, or high lignin, this is a fiber, of course. So the animals, uh, if we are talking about especially lactating cows, they need high protein, high carbohydrate, which is easily digestible than high fiber. So here I am referring to high fiber, high cellulose, and high hemic uh, hemicellulose, which is difficult for the animals to digest. And it will be exc excreted in the form of feces, rather. So of course, we can say something. But in order to conclude at that level, we are still doing experiment. It's all going on. The result didn't uh, arrive on time, but I didn't mention here about the, on conclusion. I didn't say anything about uh, the digestibility. Uh, he asked me. Not the digestibility. Uh, I mean the the. the if, you, if you can go just one step backward. Here. Please. Therefore, uh, we conclude that the silicification level of sorghum altered the composition. Oh of the cellulose and hemicellulose. Yeah, because the acid dependent Can you assume that the silicification itself alters the composition, the composition of cellulose and se hemicellulose, or there is just, maybe, maybe these are like two different phenomena, maybe affected by the same gene, but still different? Uh, this is, the, the concept is like this. If we have high silica, it binds to the cell wall in the epidermis, so it, it takes the, the, the space for the other uh, soluble compounds, which we expect. So it will take over, and then it will increase rather the fiber contents in the cell wall, in the cell. Okay. So it will contribute for the less digestibility also. But it's not, uh, it cannot be said at this moment. We are expecting the results. Okay, uh -huh. Gabriel. So then, uh, well, the, you kind of answered my question from what you uh, said to Shuki. So, uh, so if you increase the level of silica in the soil or the, like the silicate the, uh, fertilization of the plant, uh, you may say that, that it will get uh, more uh, hemicellulose and cellulose? Uh, you see, uh, plants are different uh, in their uptake uh, uh, efficiency. Like if you take uh, rice, for example, that's the largest accumulator which can accumulate up to 15% uh, silica in the dry weight. But, uh, most commonly, it's highly uh, taken up uh, by the rice, uh, by the grass families, uh, by uh, cereals. In dicots, it's not usual to look like. It, it depends on the density of these transporter genes in the roots. If the plant has a uh, high density of these uh, transporters in the roots, it will take up much. And it's already abundant in the soil. The problem is if they, the plant has uh, developed a mechanism to take up 
through uh, the, the density of this uh, transporter uh, transporters encoded by this LSI1G. Okay, I have two questions. First, um, when you started, you were talking about Germany. You were talking about Germany. 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 Um, what is really the significance of Germany and Silicon? That's the first question. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the second question is, um, Hemicellulose and cellulose, is it only silicon that affects the content in the plant? Because if you conclude here that if um, if you can have resistant lines to mm -hmm. to silicon, mm -hmm. um, you can have resistant lines to silicon, then you can have um, higher levels of, of cellulose in the plant. Is it only silicon that is the, um, the factor to the plant that is responsible for um, accumulation or direct regulation of the Okay, to start with your first question, uh, germanium is, uh, they are from the same group in the, uh, in the predictable with silica, right? So most of these uh, elements uh, from uh, the same group in the predictable from the silica, are, they have a similar uh, chemical property as we know from the chemistry knowledge. And then the study was started with germanium and they, it revealed a positive result. Uh, because it, it, it behaved as a chemical analog to silica, but this germanium doesn't exist in nature, naturally in the soil, like silica is abundant, as, 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 but this uh, germanium is very trace. So uh, the problem was to detect the movement of this silica, because although it was not abundant, the plants couldn't show any symptom of excess or deficiency of this element. Is the silica the main element for the germ? No, no, germanium is used to detect the movement of uh, silica. If a plant takes up uh, silica or not, if that plant. Especially for our experiment, we used it to differentiate between the mutant and the wild type. So just, a, just an indicator for the transport system, yeah. for, okay. for silica slash germanium. Okay. So is there any other factor that contributes to accumulation of the cellulose, uh, cellulose or just silica? I related this just it, it to silicification because we did we did on silicification that's our area of interest, and I concluded also in relation to silicification. So silicification uh, contributed for high cellulose uh, and hemicellulose in the wild type, whereas when the gene was mutated in the mutant, it con it, it just it took very very low amount of uh, this element. So in a, this is in relation only in relation to silica. Daniel, did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to know, <coughs> you mentioned both that it raises the levels of cellulose and cellulose in the cloud from silicon uh, silicification. I was wondering, does it change, he's right here that it alters the composition, does it actually change the form that it's in, or just, or does it change the levels that it's down in the cell wall? Sorry? <coughs> does the silicification change the concentration of levels of cellulose and cellulose in the cell walls, or is it altered the composition that's here? Uh, it has, again, when the silicification level decreases, uh, there is a positive uh, implication. It has a positive implication because this is on expense of uh, the silicification uh, level increment means on expense of the other soluble components, which I mentioned so far on the, on the diagram, like uh, soluble carbohydrates, proteins, and minerals, and vitamins. So, it will have again the increase in silicification will have a negative uh, contribution for these soluble components. Well, Shilpa, please. Is there any other conditions that affect the uptake of silicon in the uh, cell zone? Like, as you said, cell zone will drop the system drop. Yes. So, drop or stress conditions will affect the silicon uptake of plant? What will affect? Because uh, it's, it, it's already a drought resistance uh, crop, mm -hmm. so already the transporters are there, mm -hmm. and these elements also abundant in the soil, naturally. Mm -hmm. So it, there is nothing that can affect unless you impair the transporters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Silicification, yeah. just deposition of this silicon in the form of silica in the cell wall of the plant parts. Okay, thank you very much.